want to tell you about my childhood. Nothing will prevent me, neither close attention nor the desire to be exact, from writing and speaking words that sing. My childhood began with President Bush. Precisely. This childhood began on the day when Bush started carefully to write down the instructions which were to be carried out on the day of his funeral. He did this because he knew that people like him do not die. I this country's supreme dictator. Bush spoke clearly into his dictaphone. Otherwise known as only I. I, the everlasting, everblasting president in all other names. According to my discretionary powers as president, declare that on the day of my death, which is just about to take place, according to my wishes. Declare that my head be cut off. This head should be draped in rosebuds, roses in full bloom, and dead ones. Human bones will hang all around the dead ones. Stick the whole mass, mess, on a pike, so that the people whom I've put in prison can pay homage to me. Afterwards, the head rose bone emblem shall be this country's new flag. Seven grungy, emaciated boys shall carry the original around the courtyard of the United Nations until they drop dead. Then all the children who are now starving and feast their eyes on my empty eye sockets. My eyes shall live forever. May the death penalty, which has just been nationally reinstated, remain in effect so that everyone who worked under my auspices can be executed. There shall be no more university education. No need, for by that time human memory will have been formed. Education instead shall become this, the head rose bone emblem, or I, who shall continue talking with God. May one fact remain to continue forming human memory. Since a state is just a mass that secretes and shelters the power relations behind it, every state is fetishized or sexually desirable. For I am talking about myself. I want to describe the beginning of this world, this world of Bush, where for us there is no language. While I had been still enrolled in school, my mother, for the first time against the advice of her priest, had sent me to dancing school. By name, Miss Savage's School for Girls. I had no idea what a man was at that time. There was my cousin, 
a boy slightly older than me. Only he played basketball worse than me. So he only showed me that the word boy means nothing. Virginity doesn't know its own name. This second secondary school took place every Saturday night in one of the wealthiest parts of the city. Within those hallowed precincts of dancing school, my best friend, Maggie, who was so wild and tough that she was the head of our street gang, dedicated to the task of making all bank alarms start ringing, and I would hide in the bathroom, far away from the boys whom we despised. We smoked cigarettes while all the obedient children danced by. Outside this toilet, the girls wearing blonde hair knew how to flirt or present lying cells to boys. Their relatives were the Catholic girls I saw in the subway station every time I went to school. Catholic girls were the ones who wore green pleated skirts, white midi blouses, and white knee socks. This is the uniform of sluts who fuck every boy who comes near them, even on subway platforms. It was after some months that Loyola Savage herself ordered us to emerge from this bathroom. I was forced to dance with a boy for the first time. I did, without knowing that my body was female and that the liquid which dripped onto my thighs once a month wasn't carrot juice. My whole body expanded and became hot. I couldn't care less who the boy actually was. When my body entered this unknown world, for the first time in my life, I became frightened. In me, fear and sexual desire are now married. The first time a boy put his tongue in my ear, I did something like come. And so I learned that any boy, if he does it in my ear, will do. It is this amoral world, the one of constant wonder, of journeying, sights that amaze, in which I received and continue to receive my real education. Even if, now that I'm an adult, that world no longer bears only the name sex. The beautiful world which lies outside the school to which they sent me. Sometimes the setting sun is a series of liquid fires who illumine the deer clustered together on the hillsides. Night deepens. All the colors left turn neon. While the sun, who is almost dead, seeps through holes in the glass of the window in my bedroom, and burns my shoulders into shreds. It was night. The twilights in the west, where the dead unburied control rather than help those living. 
had deepened and grown into this all shadow. There, the English pirates, who had decided to conquer a former colony, not quite theirs, began to gather whatever money was left in the United States, money tied up in the shifting zones of the drug trade. These pirates, a combination of uneducated English, mulattoes, and gauchos, who for many years had been fermenting other forms of discontent, bikers, and a utopian community of hermaphrodites, couldn't have cared less about political doctrines and indoctrination. But as they grew more and more wealthy, as the boundaries of their pillaging operations spread geographically and in power, they began to touch the edges of the political. While the Aristos in London acted as if they were playing in an empire which had actually long since decayed, as they have always acted. On the ocean, the pirates held displays of pomp and circumstance, similar to historic biker ceremonies. The empire, or the epic, was finally over. Nobody, even of the few who could still read, knew or cared what epic. The night was complete. Some pirates who dared to more than just touching land, their version of otherness, in order only to plunder and to garbage. In a few instances, rape kept on traveling. Finally they reached, according to certain maps which were so unreadable as to be useless, the domain for which they had been searching. They had never known its name. All they found of human life on this coast was a wood house having the shabbiest possible condition. This oyster farm consisted of one salting house, the center of the shabbiness, three dead beds, deader fish smell, and the remnants of a burnt down convent. As the pirates walked toward what they sought, now only by means of their dreams, one of the nuns who was living in the hut climbed up on top of a hill made out of her own excrement and began a speech in honor of this occasion. Dear Sirs, Rags stinking from dried sea spit were barely covering the bodies of her proposed listeners who almost never in their lives had listened to anyone. Dear Sirs, 
Our cunts are red. She wanted to speak more about cunts, but some pirate interrupted her, then another. Several started belching and grunting. Nevertheless, the pirates comprehended enough of her speech to perceive that they had arrived at the Temple of Eros, or of that dirt which is red. And this day was the birthday of the nun whose cunt was hungriest. And so, I left school. All that I wanted was to fuck and to be fucked. I was just beginning to live the life that I desired. We traveled like children from hotel to hotel. live together in those rooms. One hotel was composed solely out of floors, floor after floor. Each room formed part of the intricately connected labyrinths that reminded me of a country that I've never seen. We were traveling from room to room. Then I mounted three flights of stairs. The floor I reached was very, very old. Furniture. Carpets, the wood of the walls. Its rugs were decaying red. Why, I ask, is red, which is the color of animal blood, the sign of old age? All of the rooms were tiny. I was told I was to stay here. An older, if not an extremely old woman, informed me that I could pick any room. I found a door which resembled a doll's house door. Behind this door, there were stairs which I climbed. At the top, I found myself in a larger, though not a large room. This room was where I wanted to be.
this realm or house, both knowing and comprehending were only ambiguity, because there was neither morality nor any absolute. Every event was swirling through air that was always malevolent. What was happening in this house was drugs. After I had chosen my room, I mounted stairs that were missing. And as soon as I was inside the room, I knew that I had freely entered the following world. I was the only female. One of the males had started pissing into a white toilet. During the sound of the pissing, I learned that Muru was escaping a drug bus. The more precise the details of this bus and escape became, the more detached from everything and nauseous I felt. Are the refugees from all drug busts coming to this house? In this house, except for me, there are only men. In one of their bedrooms, a man was lying on a bed. Behind him, another man leaned against the pillows that were propped up against the headboard. Jerry was one of their men. As I stood at the edge of the bedroom, one of the men asked if I would stay with them so that I could provide them the warmth. This question immediately led to a series of images, one after the other in my mind. A succession of pictures of American men. Then I understood that these images have been and are negotiating my perceptions of men. That the question, will you give me warmth, defined through these representations, fossilized as moralism. Simultaneously, I saw that I needed moralism. I is not an interior affair. Afterwards, I answered all the men, yes, I will stay with you tonight.
while he was alive, I could never talk to him. President Bush, I say to the man who is now dead, your suffering as a dead man is twofold for the following reasons. All the time that you were president and before, you cloaked yourself in oblivion. You invited oblivion to sit on your face like a fat woman on an open mouth. In this country, we know what every mole looks like on the arm of every movie star. The tattoos on the cocks of every rock and roll star. We didn't know how you played ball with before you were head of the CIA. During this time, you were hiding yourself in morality. Simultaneously, you surrounded yourself with criminals, some of whom were your relatives, who pillaged and raped the nation's peoples and resources while Jesus fucked with nationalism. Tonight, dead, you're going to visit the prisons into which all the peoples in this society who aren't desirable were and are being thrown. All those who you learned don't desire this society and those people who wanted to kill you. When you're in prison, the people who you made prisoners won't tear off your legs so slowly that the intestinal worms who live after their hosts have expired will have time to pull down your flesh. Now white shredded spirals resembling themselves. The men and women who return into death and life won't push your eyeballs out with their thumbs and feed them to not move a human friend. They won't pick up these friends and dangle them by tails. Red eyes right on your justice right testicles, which is a contest among South American torturers known by the name of which rack and fight through a bowl first. These were the pleasures which not only your international policies encouraged in the third world, then in the prisons here. The people who you place under torture will not torture you because they will not recognize you. You are dead. The dream is that which is most certain in the and in the A devil of Then my speech to the dead man turned on itself and ate itself. I knew there was still only rubble, riot, that which now goes by the name society. I don't know what to do at all that I see and experience. I can only ask.
to be human in flesh and in bone. Dear Bataille, Some people think that I'm strong, stable, and self-assured. But I don't want to be because I don't want to impose on or control others. What I'm looking for, Georges, is another power, one that's hidden, efficacious, and practical, the power to reclaim myself. I've never known this power. I'm only beginning to, now. I think you already know this. But I'm gonna try to begin to say something precisely. I'm not interested in being master in goals. For this reason, even if I do attain some goal, at that very moment, the only thing that's important to me is to go beyond that which is now no longer a goal, but only a stage. To go beyond. This sounds romantic. Actually, I don't care if I have any mastery. I've no mastery of myself. understand and realize everything that constitutes me. And on this journey of realization, I came upon, just as Ulysses must have done, a monstrous cacophony. I had no Penelope. If there's anything that can and is returning me to the arrogance in which I began this journey, such as your love, Georges, most of all it's this suffering that I now know. I'm crumbling. I came upon this. I'm crumbling. What I've just said isn't interesting to me in terms of theory. Rather, all of this is the only place, simply, where life can start, because in me, life must start in collision. Here's why I talk so much about nature. Nature is a refuge for myself from collision or opposition, from the continuing impossibility of me. 
Nature's more than just a refuge. But it's impossible to speak about it directly. The nature can be spoken about only in dream. I can't explain this. Not only to you, not even to myself. Only the dream or a dream. Is there any difference between the two? And speak about nature. I have moments when I believe that I can and will be reconciled to myself on every possible level. By living in the country, near a forest, by flowing waters. I don't know how. Not here. I spend so much time gazing into the sky and at water. I'm never bored then. Otherwise, if one day you, raising your head, see a small cloud all on its own, you'll know that I'm coming to see you. I've got a terrible need to write to you and for you not to reply. But that'll happen later. This is what I want to say. your eyes are holes. In want, everything is always being risked. Being is being overturned and ends up on the other side. It's me who's let me play with fire. Whatever it is I are the remnants. I've never considered any results before those results happened. At this moment, if I could only roll myself under your feet, I would, and the whole world would see what I am. Seven. You're safe. How easy it is for me to ask to be regarded as low and dirty. To ask to be spat upon. This isn't sluttishness. But it is the language of a woman who thinks. It's a role. I have always learned for myself. I'm a woman who's alone. Outside the accepted. Outside the law, which is language. This is the only role that allows me to be as intelligent as I am and to avoid persecution. But now I'm not thinking for myself because my life is disintegrating right under me. My life's disintegrating under me, so I'll not bear the lie of meaning. My inability to bear that lie is what's giving me strength. 
Even when I believed in meaning, when I felt defined by collision and opposition, and this opposition between sexual desire and the search for self-reclamation and self-knowledge was tearing me apart, even back then, I knew that I was only lying, that I was lying superb, disgustingly, triumphantly. Life doesn't exist inside language. Too bad for me. Kathy. Because of want, because your eyes are holes. In want, everything is always being risked. Being is being overturned and ends up on the other side. It's me who's let me play with fire. Whatever is I are the remnants. I've never considered any results before those results happened. At this moment, if I could only roam myself under your feet, I would, and the whole world would see what I am. You say how easy it is for me to ask to be regarded as low and dirty, to ask to be spat upon. This isn't sluttishness, but it is the language of a woman who thinks. It's a role. I have always learned for myself. I'm a woman who is alone, outside the accepted. Outside the law, which is language. This is the only role that allows me to be as intelligent as I am and to avoid persecution. But now I'm not thinking for myself because my life is disintegrating right under me. My life's disintegrating under me, so I'll not bear the lie of meaning. My inability to bear that lie is what's giving me strength. Even when I believed in meaning, when I felt defined by collision and opposition, and this opposition between sexual desire and the search for self-reclamation and self-knowledge was tearing me apart. Even back then, I knew that I was only lying, that I was lying superb, disgustingly, triumphantly. Life doesn't exist inside language. Too bad for me. Kathy.
so I began descending, as in my dream. Walking down the spiral staircase, which led to the witch's library. Many rooms lay off these steps. I was descending into my dreams. Deeper than I had ever been before. After further journeying, I came to a countryside. I had to give my girlfriend back her muffin. When I searched for it, the only muffin I could find was a real or a soft brown muffin. Hiding with it a fake or a stale muffin. It was all I had to give. But before I presented her with this, I stuffed my period stained underpants into my purse. At that time, my girlfriend was being examined by her doctor. During the end of the exam, I stayed with her. I liked this doctor, who was female so much that I thought about letting her examine me. But I already have a good doctor who's male. Nevertheless, in the examining room, this doctor went so far as to give me a shot. First, she wanted to inject into the bone that's right at the top or tip of the asshole. I wouldn't let her do this, because it was going to be painful. So she stuck me in the front of my left shoulder. At this section of the body, only the thinnest skin covers the bone, so the pressure from the penetrating liquid was disturbing. Why are you shooting me here? While the needle was still in my body. She explained to me that liquid travels most rapidly when it's able to descend diagonally down the body's front, as in this case. Then she drew me a picture. Outside the medical building, the air and low, dead grass were gray, the way they are on a beach whose sun has died. It's now the edge of the morning, and the sun has died. I had to give Pat, my girlfriend, back her muffin. But when I reached into my purse, there was only this smelly blood from the period stained underpants. Blood so sticky and thick that it was almost solid in the bottom.
then I kept on traveling. motorcycle I'm going to descend further in order to see Hotel of the Lilac Eyes. Addressed to someone other than Bataille. I can no longer cry. I vomit. I no longer laugh. I grind my teeth. How I despise this dry and evil laugh. It graffitis all of my senses. Every sentence which manages to escape. Every gesture which is decomposing. The me which other people think they see better than me. That I understand it better than them. Than you. And with an irony that's ferocious. And then I cry, my teeth grind, I vomit. I know full well that I'm not going to see you again. You and all the others. It's time to quit this play. It's time to completely hold my life in my own hands. To be alone in the desert, the place of stones. To be there as me, and no longer as someone who hardly resembles me. To be me, I must turn to dreaming. Listen. Every day of my life, death followed me. I saw it in the red soil in mud, in the sky of stars. I saw it partaking in the intense hatred and joys of others. Other people shared it with me, as if it was a miracle, not common. They believe that death is Christ. I saw death in the horror of the simultaneity of the frightfulness and the sweetness of language, of human communication. Death was a line of the horizon, as simple as anything, geometrical. My sight is clear. I'm not drunk. What's making me see that I'm drunk is death, is following rendering me so exhausted, I'm breaking. This death, whom I call mine, my shame, would do well to drop me off on some street corner as quickly as possible, or hand me other, over to the other shames for whom I've got respect. But I'm not going to be broken like this. I've got my childhood back. I found my childhood in pavement and in leaves, in the stable earth and in the water. Tell Bataille, and this time it's the truth, that I'm now truly the witch, the one who makes the teeth grind, the eyes blink too rapidly, Everything makes another person turn away in horror. There are no witches or eternal mother. This is who I am. 
One day, someone placed this ad in the paper. Looking for lost dog. Woof. Perhaps, 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 all I want to say is one word before everything stops. Before this ridiculous, abject, unworthy hell stops. Before death. I say it now. Lightning's gonna fall on my head. It's going to be night and full noon. Dusk is going to turn into break of day. The streets are going to be rivers. Everything except his name is foam. Foam is tossed over the edge. I'm not drunk. I tried everything. To lose myself, to get rid of memory, to resemble whom I don't resemble, to end. Sometimes when I encountered myself, I was so strange that I had to be criminal. All the time, I was totally polite. And simultaneously, my language was brutal, filthy. I meet a star. I tried to give my life away, and life came back, gushed into its sources, a stream, a storm, into the full of me, triumphant. And it stayed there hidden, like a lightning stain. This is the question. Is it possible to communicate with another person? I want to communicate. It's time.
When I involuntarily stopped speaking, as if there was no longer anything, strangled, voiceless, in this bottom of myself, I found a magnificent feast of possibilities. Then, all changed. The feast turned into a fairground of drunkenness, worse into a scummy flea market where crap was being sold. Or else, I simply saw that my eyes were shut. I recovered myself in sweat and in ash. In my search in myself, I found nothing. I'm now in a dream in and from which it's impossible to move. All my gestures are being held back, motionless. And here at times I begin to scream like a wounded animal. I'm in this dream as long as I don't either die or suicide. It's necessary to cut life into bits. For the butcher's store, the bed of a woman who's giving birth is not as bloody as this. Absurdity. Blessed insolence which saves and connivance are found in these cuts, these cuts into veracity. Or the cries of children who aren't playing the cries of humans and of the earth itself turning, the vertigo, all these are found in the cuts. Not just decadence and rot, but the entire human being is found there. No one can be more human than this. To welcome in all this hatred no one can be more human than this. I'm breaking. In the very place where my calm arrogance used to be, I find only here and now the misery and the hurt of bestial howling. Kathy. Face to face with death. I saw myself sitting on one of the benches, crying. It was the school to which my parents had sent me. I saw another girl run by with a large rubber ball. But I had to go to the bathroom again, a place where we, the girls, were allowed to be free. I had wandered away from the others, the laboratory. The sound of Baudelaire was still in my ears. I entered. An odor, halfway between the smell of a candy factory and that of school disinfectant, was hanging inside one of the cubicles. A vapor rose up from its seat, a vapor of tenderness given off by a hair. The room which I was in was so tiny that I couldn't stand back up. I looked up. Above me, the roll of white toilet paper was covered with specks of black hairs.
It was the reflection of my face before the creation of the world.